So tell us about your coaching and, you know, who are the, who's your target audience and the clients that you help? Sure. So my target audience, I focus primarily on leaders, directors to C-suite and smaller mid-sized firms, 50 to 2000 employees approximately. And I do that just because they're the ones who are usually large enough to be seeking outside support for coaching and not so big that they have inside programming that they've developed. Mm -hmm. But I'm really particularly interested, especially because of my experience in those who want to consciously shape their they're in the second half of their life, the rest of their career, they're really at a, at a pivot point in their career. They're saying, okay, I've achieved a certain amount, but something is missing. There's a yearning that I'm feeling. There's a longing that keeps coming up. And when I pause long enough and I can feel it. And so those who are really interested in, in the, being guided on that journey of self-discovery, co-discovery, perhaps rediscovery, and just sort of saying, so what's next for me? How am I supporting myself? How am I supporting those around me? What's the legacy I want to leave? Welcome to Onward Live, a live stream focused on encouraging you to create a life you love living now. Let's go beyond success to significance. Being clear on our why is crucial. It requires doing the inner work, finding ourselves, getting to know ourselves, embracing our inner child, shedding social conditioning, and letting go of perfect. We know obstacles make us stronger. We can dream big and take action. Believe you can, and you're halfway there. I invite you to tune in every week and engage with me and my inspiring guests Invite your friends. Let's make time for what matters most in our lives. Let's move onward together. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you. I see we've got some people watching, and I'm excited to have you here. And I appreciate you. I appreciate all the listeners. And thank you to everybody who was there last week for the three-year celebration of the Onward podcast. Three years, 199th episode. So Thomas, you're the 200th episode that I've recorded. So that's pretty cool. And today's June 1st. So three years ago, today was my like first day of freedom. I retired on May 31st. And then June 1st, I was like, what am I going to do? It was fun. When I think back at how much I've changed since then, it's amazing. And, you know, I just wanted to share a little bit about my coaching. I'm a certified core energy coach. And the if you're on LinkedIn, you're wondering what what's ELI slash MP. So I'm an energy leadership index master practitioner, which is an assessment I can do that helps us understand the energy that we bring throughout the day to the rooms, not just our physical energy, but our mental energy, our emotional energy, our spiritual energy. And the core energy coaching process recognizes that true change comes from within. And that's when I had a webinar last night on energy leadership. And one of the things I said is, you know, when I retired and after I've started working on myself, the world didn't change, but I did. I changed on the inside and that changed my whole external world. And you know, maybe I'll do an episode on that, what I mean by that. But tonight we've got Thomas Rosenberg in the house and I'm excited to have him here. I met him through a mutual acquaintance of ours, Oleg. And it's so cool how people just make connections on LinkedIn or through social media. So many new connections have been made through social media and that's a good thing about social media. So I love that about it. Welcome to everybody that's here. I, hi, Russ. I see you're here. And Christine Smith, congratulations, 200, but I look so young. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. Let's bring Thomas in. And one second here. Let me get the graphic right. There he is. Hello, Welcome, hello. Thomas. Thank yeah. you. You're in California, I think, right? I, I am in California, California, and I'm very happy to be your 200th interview. Yeah, that's pretty cool. If I counted right, you never know. I'm not that much of an attention to detail person. So you're a coach, too. And you, you said here on what you submitted me, you're the founder and chief calming officer 
at Regenerate Coaching. So, you know, I worked for the Navy for 34 years. I never heard of a chief calming officer. I probably could have used one. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what a chief calming officer does, because I definitely could have used one of those. Yes, it's, it's, it's the other CCO, right? So, <laughs> so it, for me, this is a moniker actually that a, a friend bestowed upon me, but it's really helping people connect to their inner wisdom and to find resources that they already have in themselves to calm them in the face of, of stress, of panic, of, of pressure in everyday life. And so I'm helping people just come back to reconnect with what's there so that they can support themselves in the moment with the resources that are already inherent in themselves. Wow. That they may not even know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, why'd you get into that line of work? Why Tell us get... about your background. <laughs> Once upon a time. No, in all seriousness, I have always been passionate about helping people grow and transform. And yet to be seen as a man in my family, I felt compelled to follow a much more technically challenging career path. I come from a medical and scientific family. And although I knew that I wasn't going to follow the family into medicine in high school, I was aware of that. I still felt the need to pursue something technically challenging. And yet that ended up with me getting to a place in my career where I was just spinning my wheels. And eight years ago, actually on the 13th, I will, it'll be eight years on June 13th. I had a near fatal bicycle accident and traumatic brain injury and some broken, broken bones and knowing because my mom worked in, in occupational therapy and so had experience with rehab, I knew that there was no guarantee how much my brain, my cognition would come back. I worked really hard for two and a half years to make sure that came back, but it was very clear for me after the accident that I was going to be shifting from the technical to the people. And, uh, that really led me towards, towards coaching. It just seemed like a natural fit where I could, instead of sticking myself into somebody else's box to the point of your, your podcast here, it was really to, how can I bring all of my gifts to the world and mm -hmm. create a life that I love living? Yeah. Yeah. Why does it have to take for some of us, it took something traumatic for me too. Why does it have to take something like that to get us to wake up? I feel like on some level, we are numbed as we grow up. You know, we are born into a family and we have to learn the rules of that family, but we're hardwired for seeking, for sorry, for se seeking safety, belonging, and dignity. And along the way, some edge of us needs to be compressed in some fashion so that we can, we can show up and we can feel safe that we belong, that our dignity in some fashion is, is acknowledged. And we have these narratives, these stories that are told to us by society. And so it's like, well, we have to have this, we have, you know, you have to have, I know for some people it's like, I have to have the white picket fence. I have to have the house. I have to drive the SUV. I have to have the dog. I have to have the 3.2 kids and you know, whatever it happens to be for you, but there are messages that we are given about what life is supposed to look like. And then we wake up and it's like, wait a minute, is this my path? Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be traumatic, but it can be, I guess in some cases dramatic, just feeling that wherever that crucible happens to be for some people, might be a divorce for other people. It might have been, for example, one of my clients, it was the pandemic bringing his kids home for school and just like, I have this job, I da, 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 da. And it's like, well, wait a minute, how do the kids fit into this? How does my marriage fit into this? And sort of saying, oh, okay. So there was that compression. And yeah. I feel like there's, there needs to be some sort of inflection point that doesn't have to be as traumatic as it was for you and I, or, or, or dramatic, but at least there needs to be that acknowledgement that what has been the story all thus far is not working any longer. It no longer serves who we are and where we want to be and what we want to live. Yeah. 
And sometimes, you know, if it's not, sometimes we can fight against that, right? We can kind of feel something needs to change, kind of think it is. And, and I'm speaking from experience, maybe be too busy to like, well, no, that can't not even stop to think, could it, should I, could I change what mm -hmm. I'm doing? Could I approach life differently? So some, I think that's why it's so important to be calm <laughs> and not be rushing around mm -hmm. being stressed all the time and busy all the time mm -hmm. to hire a chief calming officer that, that can help you like really figure it out, really listen to that inner wisdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. So you, you said also, so, I mean, like, how did your brain start to come back after mm. having that injury and how, I mean, you were pretty bad off after the accident, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, so I'm very grateful for the osteopathic care that I received. I'm very fortunate to be able to afford and have access to a phenomenal osteopath here in the San Francisco Bay area that was able to reduce the swelling that was on my brain to help my body calm down to bring more homeostasis back into the body after such a traumatic. But at the same time, there was my, my brain was reset in many ways. My nervous system was reset. So I was struggling with how much time I was spending in front of a screen or how much time I was focused trying to read a, a magazine or a newspaper. It was a pain to feel the words lodged in my brain and <clears throat> excuse me, feel a, a connection between or a lack of connection between there and my tongue. So I could see the word, I could almost imagine the whole that it existed in, in my memory, but I couldn't get it out of my mouth. Wow. And, you know, so those were the early days and that was really, really scary and challenging. And I'm also just eternally grateful for the patience of my wife and her support and care. I don't think I would have recovered as well if it weren't for her TLC. Yeah. But it, it, you know, it was, you know, constantly challenging myself and I used to I, I served in Peace Corps in South America, so I was fluent in Spanish before the accident. And it was, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get it back. And it was four years after the accident, almost four years after the accident, that we returned to Bolivia for our goddaughter's uh, graduation from medical school. And that's when the Spanish came back. But I didn't know if I was going to be able to do that. Had you tried like Spanish before you went over there and you just couldn't remember and then you went over there and it started just to come back or what? It was really rusty and jerky. And so I can remember some things and some things flowed out of my mouth very fluidly. Other things, I was like, okay, I know that word. What is that word? You know, and I just, again, it was the same gap between brain and tongue and like, how do you make the muscles move in that way? How did you... How did you stay calm? How did you not give up? There was a driving need inside of me because I knew just from what my mom had shared, seeing some of her patients in rehab when I was growing up that I needed to, the sooner I got stuff back, the more possibility there was for it to stick. Okay. And so I pushed myself and again, I'm blessed because when I had the osteopath that I was seeing every two weeks, I also had access to my mom and her experience. And so she could say, well, okay, try to do this or, or think about using something like this to support your effort and so on. But it's, you know, just the multi, the multi-sensorial stimulation was also a really big challenge for me. It took me a year before I felt comfortable driving again. And the first time I drove on the highway, I was absolutely panicked. Yeah. It, it felt, it brought me back to when I was 16 and learning how to drive and, you know, it's like, how do I manage this hurdling piece of metal, you know, and all these people around me, because that was what was actually the most overwhelming strobe lights. So if a police car is in front of me, I have, I it, like my, it's less of an issue now, but it still bothers me significantly. I have to shield my eyes from it because if it's for too long, I can't, my, my, my brain just kind of shuts down. It's just, it really overwhelmed for me. Same, you know, so I, you know. 
Did you ever get back on a bike again? I did. I have, that was, it took me three years before I started to get on the bike. I remember I actually stopped right near where I crashed and told my wife. It took me four years to remember what happened in the last half mile. Wow. So yeah, but I, I have been riding not as consistently as I used to. I was a competitive cyclist in college. So, but yeah, this is, it's a journey, right? Wow. Yeah, definitely. And you said that something else that inspired you was taking care of a friend mm -hmm. who was pass yeah. passing away. Yeah. So right about the time that my brain, I was feeling more confident in my brain. So 2015 was proving that I had a brain. 2016 was proving that it worked basically at the same level as it did before. And in the summer of 2016, a dear friend of ours was diagnosed with a very aggressive case of pancreatic cancer. And she passed within six weeks of that diagnosis. And there were eight of us who were supporting her in her transition, which was just an absolutely incredible experience. I'm eternally grateful for that opportunity. What inspired me about her is how she found ways to share all of her gifts with the world. And she lived so richly and just to be able to see that and to hear about that and the stories that we were telling each other and the reminiscing that we were sharing the eight of us. And I thought, that's what I want. What am I spending my life energy doing? I want to be able to share all of myself authentically, vulnerably, fully, so that I may really taste life however long I have left. And why am I trying to squeeze myself into somebody else's box? And that's, that's, that was just so clear for me. And so I just said, I'm going to follow Casey's example. And, and I love that. Yeah. yeah. What, have, having being by someone's side as they're, pa you know, passing away mm -hmm. is really, is really life changing. Yes, it is. And uh, Christine says, you got the term, got to get back on the bike. <laughs> it's, it's such a climb of courage in your life. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, Funny that you say that, Christine, because I am a, I am a climber. I'm, I'm pretty lightweight. I have uh, for my size and I, I go up hills real easily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well I was going to say something else, which is today I was on a podcast. I was being interviewed by a podcast that's, um, it was campfire capitalism. I think mm. and a lot of the people that Desmond interviews are talking about, you know, B2B sales and how to, you know, how to make six figures, seven figures, 10 figures, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, 10 million figures, whatever. And it's like, you know, what I talked about is who are you being while you're making that money? Mm -hmm. You know, cause, and I, say that because when I worked for the Navy, when I was working, I was like checking off all the boxes and making sure I got things done and accomplishing. And I didn't always pay attention to Emily, who are you being? And when I saw my kid's father pass away, I could tell what he was thinking. He was thinking mm -hmm. about who he had been being mm -hmm. in his life and how he had shown up. And I don't, and I know that there was many times when you know, he, that he regrets in terms of like his relationship with his kids and with me and with others. And, you know, work wasn't important at all to, <laughs> to him. And he was somebody who was, you know, kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say a workaholic, but he was really passionate about what he did, you know, helping with the spare point parts for the joint strike fighter, you know, logistics stuff for Naval aviation. And, and he worked for the army in aviation. He was really passionate about that. And there's nothing the matter with being passionate about that stuff, but I'm telling you, it's not what you think about when you're, when you're, when you're sick and, mm -hmm. and going to pass away. And so I think sometimes we all need to like, w one of the other things that one of my coaches did today is led us in a meditation, Shirzad Shamin, because I'm a positive intelligence coach. He led us in this meditation where it was about 20 minutes, but we envisioned ourselves meeting with our elder wiser self. Mm -hmm and asking what's important now 
you know, what would, w maybe take a situation to him or her saying, this is what I'm dealing with. What should I do? Go ask your elder wiser self. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I, I think that's, I haven't heard of that exercise, but it makes complete sense mm -hmm. to me just in terms of what if we can tap into that wisdom on a regular basis? What are those resources that we're skipping over? And it also just makes me, your comments earlier about, you know, holding space for the father of your, your kid and, and as, as they passed. And so just thinking about two books come to mind. So one is Stephen Levine's A Year to Live. Mm -hmm. And Stephen Levine passed a few years ago, but he spent over 30 years working in hospice. And so a lot of these questions, like what are the regrets? How, what is it that you want to do? And there's a, a friend of mine, actually a, a fellow coach went through a, a year long book club with around that book. So they they're it's out there and it's just fascinating to see what that can bring up. And then there's a more recent book that was published uh, 4,000 weeks. It's the same thing. Right. It's like, what are we spending our life energy on? And to your point, how can we come back to the wisdom that already exists? Mm -hmm. Right. Because I feel like when you're tapping into that, having not having done that exercise in particular, but my sense is you're tapping in. It might not just be your elder self. It might actually be the universe that is yeah. channeling through you. And so like, what is the right way to walk through? this situation, this life, how are you making decisions? How are you being to your point rather than how are you doing? It? Yeah. And what he did at the end of that meditation, he asked us to, you know, maybe think about a particular situation that we're facing or think about, you know, in our relationships, what would our elder wiser self say right now? What's important mm -hmm. right now? What's not important right now that I'm focused mm -hmm. on? What's mm -hmm. not really important right now? Yeah. Um, you know, he coaches big CEOs from big companies and sometimes they're like, well, I'm busy. I've got this big problem. Okay. How can that problem at work? Because he was talking about self-actualization. We all want to improve. We all want to become the best person we can be. So how can mm -hmm. this problem or this challenge at work be a gift or an opportunity in terms of helping you self-actualize, mm -hmm. helping you becoming a better person mm -hmm. while you're you know, kind of solving that problem. So think about both things, just solving the problem. And then also how, how are you becoming better? How is this a gift for you? And then at the end of the meditation too, he said, now integrate, imagine integrating yourself with that elder wiser self, because you're still that, that mm -hmm. elder wiser self is in you, just mm -hmm. like that child you is in you. Mm -hmm. So yes. I thought that was pretty cool. It is very cool. So tell us about your coaching and, you know, who are the, who's your target audience and the clients that you help? Sure. So my target audience, I focus primarily on leaders, directors to C-suite and small or mid-sized firms, 50 to 2000 employees approximately. And I do that just because they're the ones who are usually large enough to be seeking outside support for coaching and not so big that they have inside programming that they've developed. But I'm really particularly interested, especially because of my experience in those who want to consciously shape their, their, the second half of their life, the rest of their career, they're really at a, at a pivot point in their career. They're saying, okay, I've achieved a certain amount, but something is missing. There's a yearning that I'm feeling. There's a longing that keeps coming up. And when I pause long enough and I can feel it. And so those who are really interested in, in being guided on that journey of self-discovery, co-discovery, perhaps rediscovery, and just mm -hmm. sort of saying, so what's next for me? How am I supporting myself? How am I supporting those around me? What's the legacy I want to leave? That's awesome. That's awesome. So this is your web website. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a blog. What, what kinds of things do you blog about? So I'm blogging about some of the things that are, are more personal, certainly about my own experience, but it's really talking about the different aspects of leadership and going into more depth than most blogs I feel do 
with regards to the different aspects of leadership. My coaching thing is one, I'm an integral coach. So from New Ventures West, uh, if there are any New Venture West folks out there here in San Francisco, it's the home of integral coaching that takes the whole person and their entire social context into consideration. So it's a developmental approach and really helping somebody deepen on their their developmental journey after age 26, it's no longer biologically determined. So it's a question of choice, that self-actualization that Prasad was talking about. And so for those who are choosing to go down that path, and I am, so I, I received my certification from them and I am currently pursuing another coaching certification in part because of my experience healing from the accident uh, with Strozzi Institute and somatic coaching. And so it's really working through the body. We are what we practice, how we talk, how we sit, how we speak, how we stand, mm-hmm. how we hold tension. And that influences how we are perceived, how others perceive us. Oh, yeah, for sure. So somatic coaching. Mm-hmm. Wow, I hadn't heard of that. Yes. And it's, it's, you know, we learn through the body. So thinking of walking, talking, reading, writing, driving, just name a few, right? Those are all learned through the body. And yes, you can talk about something, but when you experience it, it's a completely different sensation to be able to say, oh, right. This is what that feels like. And, and it's a whole body experience. It's not like, oh, I know that when the sun rises, the sky turns pink, right? Yeah. It's like, that's what it feels like when the sky turns pink. Yeah. So Christine has a question. Mm-hmm. Have you seen a wow, aha moment for a person in leadership that you coach that has energized you? What a great question, Christine. Mm. Yes, I am fortunate that there have been many of those moments. One was, I'll just share two quickly here, was one was was with one of my earlier clients and it just really stood out for me because his excitement, but he was moving up from, I guess, sort of junior, junior executive to into a more executive role. And he was trying to be that little kid. It's like, don't oh, see me, see me. I'm here in the room, see me. And I said, what if you didn't do that? You were just to ask questions, to bring people back to the core of what the conversation is supposed to be about. And so he started doing that and it changed his relationship with everybody in the room. And he was seen as a more mature leader just because of the change in his, how he showed up. And he was so excited and it just also made his life so much easier because he didn't have to work so hard. Yeah. And it's just like, he just showed up as himself and he asked questions that were percolating and he didn't feel like he needed to be leaning forward, raising his hand all the time. Another one was just recognizing this, this client I had more recently was him recognizing that he was living somebody else's life and that he had choice to choose, you know, he had the choice to, am I following this path or am I cultivating one that is authentic to me and the way I want to live, the way I want to raise my boys, the way I want to, the relationship I want to have with my wife. I love that. It's so, awesome as a coach when you can, that's what we want to do, right? Help people. And when you help people and you see them taking action, because you can't do it for them, the client has to take that action, right? Mm -hmm. You can inspire them, you can encourage them, you can ask questions, empowering questions that have them see different aspect of themselves or their situation. And the client actually has to, to do it. So Mm -hmm. absolutely. The client does the work. I'm just holding the space. Yeah. And so Tony says, I've known Thomas for over 20 years. He's always been a CCO. And I know what she means, chief calming officer. (laughs) Thank you, Tony. (laughs) (laughs) Greg Olson says, interesting. So our AL, interesting. So our ALS veterans and DAV heroes. I'm not sure how that, what that comment was in respect to with what you were saying, but Shannon says, Hi, Shannon. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Shannon Epps, she's a regular coming here watching us, <laughs> watching the show and inter- 
interacting in the comments. So if you have, if you guys have any questions for Thomas, let us know. So in Thomas, what you submitted to me, you said you, you rediscovered the forgotten wisdom of your heart and your mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? After your accident? After my accident, sure. So with, especially with a traumatic brain injury, my brain was forcibly, my cognition was forcibly quieted. And I was forced to seek out resources that are innate to all of us, but that I had disregarded or, or just forgotten about. Mm -hmm. And discovering how much was there, how much richness, how much opportunity there was to sense into what was going on around me and what was right for me or like what was right in the moment, how to make a decision. You know, uh, neuroscience has shown us that our bodies are, 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 sorry, are scanning the environment around us for threat or safety multiple mm -hmm. times a second. And yet we forget about that. It's like, oh, how many well, times a second? Multiple times. Wow. Okay. So just thinking about that, it's like, you know, you're, you're talking with somebody all of a sudden you get, you like, oh, I felt a strange vibe all of a sudden halfway through the conversation. Well, that was your neuroception going, something's off here. And, or you walk into a room and you're like, I could cut the tension with a knife, mm -hmm. right? That's a threat. Yeah. And it's just like, what do you do? And that puts you into a certain state. And so if you know what's going on for you and you can say, oh, so what's going on here right now for me and how can I find my resources? How can I come back to center as we're taught in somatic coaching? How can I come back to center so that I have all of the resources available to me to make the most appropriate decision? I like yeah. that because sometimes we think that all the resources available to us is what's outside of us, right? Let me go yeah. read a book. Let me go talk to somebody. Let me do this or that. And a lot of the resources are inside us and we don't always use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's, that's the other thing too, is we're in the society, we're trained to grow up and we stay here in the head, right? Mm -hmm. So we forget what's going on beneath us. And, and certainly for men, I feel like there is an additional challenge because there's that male archetype you're not supposed to feel unless it's like anger. You're not supposed to, you know, it, it, so there's like, how do you, how are you able to touch into more of that? So you can feel more of what's passing through you all of the time and then choose to channel it in the most appropriate direction. Yeah. And I, and I, for, for me, and I, and I say this, I'm not like embarrassed or not thinking, well, s s people must think you're crazy, Emily. Cause I know there's other women out there and probably men too, that feel what I felt is like, I was always so busy that, and I, and I know now that I stayed busy to not feel those feelings. I would notice them, but then I'd push them aside and keep going. Right. Yep. And one of my past guests said that when you shove your feelings to the basement, they lift weights. <laughs> they, <laughs> 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 and it's true. They did. I mean, cause like all the feelings from when I got a divorce from my kid's dad and, and stuff like that, they, everything started coming back when he was sick and when he passed away. And I, I just had to process all of the stuff that I had never even processed. Mm -hmm. And I think that it can make you sick. It can make you sick in your, you, you can make you, you feel aches and pains. It kind of just, mm -hmm. it's like stuck energy that just stays in us. And it's really key to notice that and to feel it and to acknowledge it and to let it go. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. I, I think that's also the definition of trauma, right? It's stuck energy. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can allow everything to flow through you in the right. moment and feel whatever it happens to be, that's the other thing too, is the, the distinction between I am angry. So you're identifying with it rather than I'm feeling angry. Right. Are you allowing that wave, you know, think about it as, as uh, emotional surfing, right? It, right. You know, let the wave move through you. But if you let it carry you to the beach, it's going to hurt when you land. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, and 
<clears throat> when I retired, I knew that I wanted to feel my feelings again. I couldn't even really name them. And I, and I know Brene Brown had this uh, one guy, I don't remember his name on her show where it's called, he wrote a book called permission to feel. Mm -hmm. And he lays out all these emotions. Cause I could have told you happy, sad, you know, glad, you know, so I would work with a coach and she'd ask, well, what do you feel about that? I'm like, I don't know. I know what I think, but I don't know what I feel. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to be able to name your feelings, not mm -hmm. just your thoughts, but name your feelings and actually feel them and acknowledge them mm -hmm. and then take a deep breath and let them and let them go. And sometimes it takes more than just a deep breath. Sometimes it takes a lot of feeling your feelings. Yeah. And, you know, just as a real life example, I, I, I gave this on the show it's just so listeners can like, well, what does that mean? It means like one day, night my dad said something uh, that I live near them and he said something that triggered me and I got really frustrated by it. And on the way home, I wanted to, and so what I do when I get frustrated, it's knowing how you react in situations and then choosing how you want, to, would rather respond and respond that way. But I, this was a big stressor for me. So I didn't react the way I would have wanted to. When I react, I just kind of withdraw. I don't go into conflict, but I just withdraw and I'm just like, you know, don't say anything. And so on the way home, and I, and I don't drink a lot, but on the way home, I wanted to stop at the grocery store and get wine. I didn't. I kept going. But then I wanted to watch TV, right? So these are all ways of numbing and not feeling mm -hmm. the feelings. Mm -hmm. So I sat there, felt the feelings. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? How does it feel? Journaled. And it was hard. And then I was able to kind of understand myself better and to reconcile things and, and accept some things ab about my dad and to understand why what he said triggered me. What it, instead of blaming my dad, you know, you said that and it hurt me. Look at myself. Why did I get triggered by that? What does it say about me? Mm -hmm. What am I still holding on to and not letting go? That's just like a real life example. And maybe you have another one that you want to share too, Thomas. Well, yeah. absolutely. I mean, there's the fascinating thing with the, with the Strosi work certainly over the last nine months is just, it's opened up a lot of insights, you know, but for me, it was one of the big ones recently was just recognizing how there was something that I had been holding anger towards my father for mm -hmm. since I was 10. Mm -hmm. right? And I didn't know that it was still in my body. And it's like, Oh, this is what has been shaping our, our relationship for the last 43 years. And wow. right, you know, so it's, it's, it's just, I had no idea that I was still holding on to that and to at least acknowledge it and say, oh, so this is, this is how it shaped me. This is how I've shown up because of it. And in so many different situations, whether it was, you know, it, it just is really fascinating. It's like, oh, whether that's with, even with clients now or with friends or all throughout my life. It's just like, this is, this is amazing. I had no idea that this is why I was showing up that way and why this was even annoying for other people sometimes. Now That's I know so where interesting. it comes from. Yeah. You know, cause uh, we, we look at the world through these lenses, these glasses, you know, I could put on these glasses, these glasses mm -hmm. have a lens of all my past experiences, my, what I was taught when I was growing up, everything. That's how we look through the world. Mm -hmm. You were still looking through the world with a tint on there from something that happened when you were 10 that yeah. you didn't even realize. Exactly. Yeah. You got used, I got used to the tint. <laughs> yeah. You got used to the tint. It looked fine with you, you mm -hmm. know, didn't know that there could be a different tint. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Greg, I'm sorry to hear that. He said his dad got diagnosed with ALS at 57. Seven. It changed his life. I bet mm -hmm. you it did. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that, Greg. That's a tough... Uh, ALS is no fun. Mm -hmm. It's really challenging. I'm sure it was challenging on you too, Greg. Christine says... Let's see. Oh, wait. Where's she say? That's scary, Emily. When you push your emotions to the basement, they lift weights. Yeah. It is really true. So Christine says, so true, Thomas, these long head held feelings shape us and how we look at our world, ourself and our others. And a lot of them, it's unconscious. 
It's in our subconscious. We don't mm-hmm. even know. Yeah. One of my teachers says that we are usually trying to solve a problem that we started trying to solve as children. Well, the thing that, I mean, the thing with my dad, I love my dad. He was, you know, I was a good basketball player and I was also like had the pleaser attitude and I was always trying to please him and do better and score better. And, you know, and after a game, he'd say, good game. Now, you remember that time when you went right, you could have gone left. So I kind of developed a pleaser mentality and I'm always trying to please him. I'm 59 and I still sometimes try to please him. So Mm -hmm. I, it was a situation where he didn't react how I couldn't even, that doesn't even impress you, whatever I had said. Mm -hmm. And so that's what made me look at myself. Why am I still trying to please him? It, that, you know, and in many ways I'm, I'm not, but in that way I was. So yeah. mm-hmm. Greg says it was actually good. Well, I'd love to hear more about that, Greg, when we have it, if we have a chance to chat at some point. Okay. So what is it what, you work with? So the company hires you or the individuals hire you? Both. It really depends. You know, sometimes execs aren't going to get that support for within the company mm-hmm. or they don't want the company to know about it. Other times the company, you know, hires me or, or and says, I've got two folks who are direct reports who are struggling as leaders. You know, I worked with a couple of directors in a biotech firm and it was their, their SVP that, that hired me to work with them because he saw them struggling to make that shift from really superb scientist to effective leader of a team yeah of course it's a completely different skill set but yeah you know that's a big shift it is a big shift and so helping them work through that and and recognizing what what were the narratives that they were trying to lead with so that was really helpful Yeah. I mean, you know, when I worked, I didn't get a coach until I worked for the Navy as a senior executive. So at the very end of my career is when they're like, Oh, do you want a coach? And that's when they usually, you know, get coaches for people. And there, there's a lot of mentoring, but mentoring Mm -hmm. is not the same as coaching. Mm -hmm. Mentoring's like, you know, how did you get to that job? I want to get to that job. And someone Mm -hmm. tells you kind of how, but coaching is not telling you how to do anything. It's, you know, empowering you to find the answer within yourself. And I commend those companies for investing in a coach because that's really, that's really awesome. Not everyone does that. So Christine's asking, could you give more examples of somatic therapy or or coaching that you use with your client? Sure. So it is coaching, not therapy. I'm not a a licensed clinical specialist, either a social worker or a therapist, but rather than talking about you know, for example, Emily was talking about feeling fully her emotions just a few moments ago. And so what we could do is we could just go back to an example like that for you, Christine, and just sort of say, okay, so what is it like to feel into that right now? If you just bring yourself back to that particular moment, how did you respond? And what is that, what is that shape? that physical shape or that physical manifestation of that emotional shape, you know, were you feeling really tight and, and, and hunched over and afraid, or, you know, were you trying to be angry and, you know, but also noticing is a sort of thing. Okay. So where's the tension? What, what does that cut off for you mm. and really becoming aware of, Oh, you know, because we often in somatic coaching, we talk a lot about, at least in the Strozzi methodology, your length, which is your dignity, your width, which is your line of connection to yourself and the rest of the world, and your depth, which is your lived history, your ancestral, your ancestors and those who came before you, your teachers, your mentors, and becoming really aware of where you, what are you cutting off? What are you short circuiting in or, you know, as habitually? And that way you can start to say, oh, so this is how I, tend to respond under pressure mm-hmm. and that doesn't really serve who I'm trying to be in this world. I hope that answers your question, Christine. 
That's a good answer. I mean, you know, how many times do we like plan out it with, with companies, we do strategic planning and set goals and plan and think, you know, lay out the values of the company and the mission statement. And we don't really do that stuff for ourselves. Like, uh, who, who do I want to be? What's, mm -hmm. you know, how do I want to show up? Besides just accomplishing tasks or a big goal, how do I want to be while I'm doing that? You know, mm -hmm. you go into a, a meet, you know, I know I used to go from one meeting to another to another, and I didn't really think like, take some time to center. How do I mm -hmm. want to show up in this meeting? Right. I was more thinking like, what do I want to get done from this meeting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not as much as how do I want to show up? Right. And uh, so, yeah. So what does it mean to, you know, this show is about create a life you love living mm -hmm. now. What's a life you love living? What does that mean for you, Thomas? Mm -hmm. So f for me, it would be, it is still something that I'm, that's evolving and, mm -hmm. and becoming, but it's, doing something that makes me passionate of, you know, about helping others and that I really enjoy supporting others journeys. It's about rich relationships with friends, family, nature. It's about having experiences that I can share, you know, whether that's with friends, family, you know, travel, just experiencing others and really tasting life that could be going to a museum exhibit that could be going to a concert that could be going for a hike with friends or a picnic or you know, whatever it happens to be, but just really tasting those things that, that connect us as humans and, and taking the time to pause and really revel in that connection and that contact. I love that. It sounds like too, you're saying, enjoy every minute, like be in the present moment mm -hmm. through all that you're living through. A lot of times, you know, one of the, I gave a webinar last night on uh, energy leadership. And one of the things I was talking about are, you know, about our energy levels and the, you, you can feel like joy just during your normal day. You don't need to go on a vacation mm -hmm. to feel that joy. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I go walking my dog and I just get, overwhelmed with joy and I think it's because I'm more in tune with my feelings my emotions and I'm living I'm I'm spending my time doing something I really love and I've really can I feel like I've grown a lot on the inside and that just brings me joy and so many times we look to the outside like well, I get a new car, or a new pair of shoes or this or that, or go on a vacation. You can, f I didn't really know that because I used to like go camping to feel, you know, to just relax and get away. And I had a coach tell me, you can find that, that joy and that relaxation in your every day, just sitting in your condo or whatever. And I didn't really believe it until I discovered it and learned it for myself from mm -hmm. that inner work. Yeah. And that sounds like that's what you're describing. Mm-hmm how you like yeah, to live. Indeed. And not to say that there isn't going to be conflict or there isn't going to be you know, moments of frustration, but to your mm -hmm. point, it's about feeling it all and being present to that so that you feel you're showing up with, you know, and, and responding in a way that is most appropriate. Yeah. Awesome. Even if you're triggered. Yeah. Well, how do people work with you? Do they go to your website? Let me find your Yes, if they can go to my website, take a look at regenerate.coach. There are a couple of, there's ways to schedule to get onto my calendar. You can just click one of the buttons and that's probably the best way. Or you can also just reach out via email, thomas at regenerate.coach. Thomas F at regenerate. Sorry, re thomas at regenerate.coach. Okay. All right. There you go. And, or connect with Thomas on LinkedIn. Yes, indeed. Awesome. Are you on there often on LinkedIn? You check yes. It? I can't say daily, but you know, several times a week. Okay. Awesome. And, and then check out Thomas's blog. There's the mm -hmm. website there. And I'll yes. put that in the show notes when I put all these links in the show notes for people who are going to listen to this later or listen and listen to it on as a regular 
podcast. What I'm doing is putting them up on the screen because we're live right now, but you'll see it in the show notes. You'll see links and be able to reach Thomas. So any last words of wisdom, Thomas, for us? Any last words of wisdom? Wow. Yeah. that's Or anything that you want to share? No, I just thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure being in conversation with you. And I'm really glad that Oleg introduced us and I hope listeners and watchers have found this fruitful and, and insightful. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed our interview. Thank you everybody who commented and participated in this live stream. I really appreciate you. It's always nice to have people engaging in the chat. Let's see, I see another chat here. Christine says, Physical manifestation of that emotional shape and so much more somatic coaching from Thomas Rosenberg, chief calming officer. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate you. So thank you everybody for being here. Now I am actually doing something that I encourage others to do. I'm taking a little break next week. I'll be on a, a short trip kind of work related. And then the week after the that I'm going to be spending a week with my grandson and my son and his wife. And we're going to go to my son's dad's brother's house and just chill. He lives on the, on the Eastern, on the West, on the Eastern shore of Virginia. So on the water, we're going to do some fishing and just hang out. And, and then the week after that, I'm going to Portland, Oregon for the world domination summit. I've talked to the, about that event on the show before. That's kind of, that's the event I first went to in 2014 that, introduced me to coaching and a whole different way of, of being and living that made me think, I want to kind of do something different. And I, and I did when I retired. I, I didn't do what people tell me I should do, like be a, a, a government contracting consultant. I became a, a coach and a podcast host. And then that's kind of how I learned about coaching and podcasting when I went to that World Domination Summit. So what I'm going to do is just replay some interviews from uh, that I've done in the past, the next few weeks. So if you want to come and check out my uh, Facebook and, and LinkedIn at 7.30 on Wednesdays, you will see a replay of a show. But other than that, yes. Hi, Gracie. Yes, I will be out of town and enjoying life. Yeah. And I'm going to do it again in July because I'm going to take my grandson to Denver and see my daughter. We're going to go look for dinosaurs at Dinosaur Ridge. So you know, I, I love everything that I'm doing and I all, am also making time for friends and family. And I've never taken a week off, actually. So, I mean, no, I did, I think over Christmas, but I'm starting to do that more. And it's awesome. And I know you guys won't forget about the show. You'll still support the show. So thank you all again for watching. If you want to learn a little bit more about me and the coaching that I offer, you can go to my website, which is emilyharmon.com. And another thing that I do is I lead the Onward Movement, which is a Facebook group, Facebook community, which is all about creating a life you love living now. And one of the things that I'll be away for is on June 10th in Maryland, we're doing a little hike. So I call the people in that group onwarders. And so onwarders that are in the Maryland, Northern Virginia, DC area, and anybody else who wants to go, if you don't know about it, reach out to me and meet us at Calvert Cliffs on June the 10th. We're going to do some hiking and look for shark's teeth. You know, it's kind of neat that it's right at the Chesapeake Bay and Sharks used to roam that bay, and you can find shark's teeth that are millions of years old if you look really hard. So thank you all for watching. I appreciate you, and we'll be back again next week. Not live, but a replay will be playing next week. Have a great week, everybody. Onward Live is sponsored by Emily Harmon Coaching and Consulting. Visit my website, emilyharmon.com, to learn more about me and my coaching programs. I'd love to help you create a life you love living. Remember, every adversity is our own personal university. Sometimes the lessons are difficult and we must learn from our experiences. Vulnerability is your superpower. You are lovable and worthy. And we discuss these topics and more because professional is personal. Thank you for joining us and engaging with me and my guest. I look forward